Hello everybody, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Miguel, that you all know. Uh, what you might not know is that he's actually a telecommunication engineer. He got his uh, degree from the UPC in Barcelona, as far as I know, in 2002. Um, after that, he went for quite some international experience. Uh, he did his PhD uh, in Brussels, but also had longer stays at uh, Amsterdam at the university and also in Florence, not only for holidays. Uh, in Brussels, it's also that I had, I had the pleasure to meet him and uh, was allowed to jump in as a co supervisor for his thesis that he received with great success in 2006. And since 2007, he has been here at FISC, um, working on different uh, topics involved in the Picasso project in the beginning and then being absolutely instrumental to build up uh, the labs. And today he's going to tell us how exciting the labs are today and what they have to offer. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. And as the title of the presentation of the seminar says, it's about uh, a summary of the experimental capabilities that are now available here in IFIS uh, for the past year. And it's, I'm not going to present my work, but rather a summary of the results that we have obtained so far. And for that, it's a collaboration between some people here in IFIS and also some uh, uh, guest scientists that we had, like Laurent Marger and, and Jordi Tiana, during, during this year, and also David Zuko, who is also here in, in the audience today. And just to summarize a bit what we have here in IFIS, we have two fully equipped laboratories, one for optics, one for electronics. I'm going to talk mainly about the optics lab today. And uh, in the optics lab, we study semiconductor lasers. And it's a combined study of, this, of the dynamics of semiconductor lasers. And we have uh, temporal acquisition, which is the fastest in the, in the market. That's provided by Detroit here. And then we also have in the frequency domain a real-time acquisition with a large uh, frequency resolution, which is the technology edge of, uh, and that's the instrument here, that's the real-time spectral analyzer that it was acquired this year as well. And it's also possible to, of course, to detect the optical signal and characterize it. And another very interesting instrument that we have here in the, uh, in the optics lab is this one here, which is an arbitrary wave generator, and with this instrument you can, fit, uh, you can modulate the lasers with any uh, waveform that you provide to the instrument with a large bandwidth, up to uh, 12 gigahertz. So, let me motivate a bit why we study semiconductor lasers with feedback. And as you may know, uh, at the beginning, uh, semiconductor lasers with feedback were seen as detrimental because normally you wanted a stable output of the laser. But as soon as you had uh, feedback, so some reflections of light going back to the laser, you would have some uh, chaotic dynamics, some oscillations in your laser. That's what no, that was not wanted at the time. But I, th I, can, I think I can say that today, uh, semiconductor, semiconductor lasers with delay induced dynamics are, are a good topic and what have been for a while. And uh, for instance, here in IFIS, we have the example of chaos uh, communications, which are based on uh, chaotic synchronization. And then also it has been seen that the interesting properties of, top of the synchronization of coupled semiconductor lasers can be used to understand here the synchronization in the brain. Or for instance, also the dynamics of the lasers can be used for information processing, as, uh, as it is the case of the focus project. And so today I'm going to talk about the experimental capabilities and the practical implementations of, the, of several setups. <coughs> so, since I will cover out of topics, uh, the, I will maybe forget a bit about the physics behind these experimental results, but I will give references that you can link to. So, basically, I will talk about semiconductor lasers with coin optical feedback, with mutual, two lasers mutually coupled with delay, with polarization of deep optical feedback, then also uh, electro optical feedback combining electronics and optics, and finally, the electronic circuits with the uh, data. So typically, so that's just the sketch of what you have. You have the laser emitting light, 
then the light uh, with, uh, is sent to a mirror, this mirror reflects the light, and part of that light is coupled back into the laser cavity. And that excites some, some instabilities in the device. Typically, uh, experiments are made on three um, in the air, so, but uh, today I'm going to present the results we have with lasers coupled to optical fibers. So in typical, we have the laser, which is controlled in temperature and current, and it is fiber, the light is coupled to a fiber, and then we use fiber couplers, for instance, for the feedback loop or for detection. And then the detector uh, transforms the optical signal to electrical, and we look at it at the temporal place and in the frequency analysis. And here I give you some references that will stay in the, at the bottom of the, of the slides. So, how does it look in the, in the lab? So, that's the, here's a picture of the optical table. And this one here is the laser. And the laser is coupled to some fibers. And these optical fibers, for instance, if you use a fiber, cap, a fiber cutter, you can produce a, a feedback loop. First thing that you notice when you study coil optical feedback with lasers is that the, if you measure the light emitted by the, les, the, by the laser versus the current, you notice a reduction in the threshold. So this is the power emitted by the laser versus current, and in black you have the laser without feedback, and in red the laser with coil optical feedback, and you see that there has been a reduction in the, in the threshold emission. So that's the first thing that, that you check in your experiment, that's the case. So, before I show you the experimental results, let me relate it to, to the well-known model of Blanco Ayasi. In the, in the seminal paper in, in a, uh, 30 years ago, they modeled the analysis of uh, delay feedback, and uh, for semiconductor lasers, you have a uh, question for the field, one question for the carriers. Here I just show the one for the field, and the important part of the feedback dynamics is this term, which includes the feedback delay, and some feedback exchange. So that's the, the important part. And these are the kind of measurements that we get. So these are not simulations, these are real experiments, even if, it, if they look uh, surprising. So, so I will tell you why they are surprising. So here uh, we have uh, the laser for two different currents. One very close to the threshold of the laser, which is around 11 milliamps, and one a, a higher current, which is 16 milliamps. And this gives uh, two different dynamical regimes. And uh, first, let me comment on the one on the left. That's what is called the low frequency fluctuation regime. And you see that I plot here one, thing, one curve in red and one in, in black. So in bl if you look at the, at the red one, that's what it was typically measured uh, until a couple of years ago because of the limitation in the, in the bandwidth of the equipment. The detectors, the scopes, normally you were limited to this one gigahertz resolution. And then what you, what you saw is some drastic uh, dropouts of the power of the laser, but now that we have the capabilities of these uh, high bandwidth detectors plus the, the scope for, for, display, for, the, for the display of the time trace, we can record the one in black, which is the real dynamics of the laser, which has a large bandwidth, so with a 12 gigahertz uh, resolution, you can really see the real dynamics of the laser and not only a band pass or a low pass uh, representation of, of the real dynamics. And if you look at uh, larger currents, then you, you have just yes, the chaotic fluctuations of the output of the laser and you don't recognize anymore this low frequency fluctuation. In, so that was, that, those were the time traces. And if you analyze further the time traces for these two different currents, yeah. 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 so does that mean that most of the energy is above uh, one gigahertz? That what I mean? Because the black well, space is much larger than the. So, so most of the power is at frequencies above. That's the spectrum of the laser. Uh -huh. So now we have the limit of 12 gigahertz, which is actually the detector. But if you look at one gigahertz, you, yeah. let, you are left with only. Small part of ten percent, ten percent. Yeah. So that, so there's, that's why we have, I think, the, the opportunity for. But yet, excuse yeah, me. Sorry. Yeah. But if you measure on one gigahertz, with respect that you somehow uh, integrate all the power from the higher frequencies, not that you lose the power when you measure. Well, if you have, 
I mean, if you have an average of our single, you would get you would recover back the one gigahertz. So in the end, it's not when you when you have the one gigahertz bandwidth, normally you will have a cutoff or some decay of the of the instrument. So you will have maybe this response over over imposed to the real signal of the of the damage elevation. So you will have the frequency response of your detectors mixed into your real dynamics. So that, that's what will happen. So for instance, uh, if you look at the spectrum, so it covers uh, 10 gigahertz or so. And if, so that's the full spectrum of the dynamics uh, in frequency. And if you look at an enlargement of the, over the first uh, 200 megahertz, you see that it has a large contribution and low frequencies. That's for the uh, low, fre uh, low fre frequency fluctuation regime. And you see these oscillations. And these oscillations in frequency are spaced by the inverse of the delay time in the external cavity. So that's typical of delay induced dynamics. And that is also seen at a large scale, <coughs> where you have again a very broad spec uh, spectrum corresponding to the chaotic dynamics. And Again, you see the peaks uh, here induced by the, by the delay. Another way to look at it is by the autocorrelation function, where and this autocorrelation function compares the signal to itself, but with a time shift, let's say. So if you have, uh, for this again, I showed examples of these two currents. And then, so the autocorrelation based with time, you see here that it has some oscillation here, and this this typical time scale corresponds to the low frequency fluctuation regime, which is much larger than, for instance, the delay. And the delay time, you can see here an, an enlargement of the over the first nanoseconds. This first peak is the, 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 the echo corresponding to the, to the feedback, and it's about 38.5 nanoseconds. So the typical time scales of the laser are one side, you have the 10 gigahertz, more or less of the, that's the, the width of the spectrum, corresponds to the width, more or less, of the first autocorrelation peak. Then you have the delay dynamics, so you have echoes at the, at the delay time. And then you have also the low frequency fluctuations over overall. But that's, that happens at 12 milliamps, and at this other uh, current, above, well above uh, the threshold, then you don't see the low frequency fluctuations, but you keep the other two time scales, which are the delay, and also the, the 10 gigahertz width of the, of the spectrum, which relates to the, to the narrow peak, narrow so that we can see. Why the LFF does not appear in autocorrelation? Sorry? The LFF does not appear in autocorrelation because it's too... Well, this, this would, it would be this, this band here. So no ah, no. okay, so it's far away from... Uh, yeah. In that, in that, in that, yeah, in there? In there here, so you would have yeah, maybe yeah, okay. twice this, that, you would that, that, still see... Yeah, it's cut it, not it's cut it. Because it's much larger than all the other... Yeah. Uh, and that's why it's called low frequency fluctuation because they have some, uh, lower frequency. But if you were measuring with one gigahertz data, you you will still observe this. Yeah. So normally, they, normally, when you look, when you have a limitation in the bandwidth, what you typically see is very well the low frequency fluctuation because okay. because it filters out all the fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was that's why it was so studied at the beginning because that's what more or less you could this dynamics you could reproduce very well with the low with the small bandwidth uh, of the detectors and so on, but not the fast one. And now we can study both the slow and the fast. Now I will switch to another setup. And again, it's dynamics induced by delay, but in this case, it's, uh, I, was just, I will just show what happens when you couple two lasers. So just a sketch of the setup, we have laser one, laser two, and there is a delay in the coupling between the, the two lasers. If you want to relate it to uh, the model, that would be the equation for the field now. You have, for laser one, you have the coupling of, uh, from laser two with a delay and with some, with, uh, some coupling set, and it will be symmetric. The coupling is there for one to two. It will be the same as the one from two to one. Is there no phase then? Phase, uh, you, can, you can also include the phase, yeah. And, well, and also you can include the tuning of the lasers, which is not there. but. So it's important that here we use two lasers which are almost identical. In that case, uh, if the lasers are almost identical, then you can consider they have the same parameters, which is not always the case. And it's difficult, but we get the lasers, uh, the providers of nanophotonics, and if they, in the case the lasers are very similar, 
then you can consider this more or less the same parameters for both lasers. And then uh, here I show you uh, the time trace of one of the lasers. And so you more or less recognize the dynamics of the single laser of the single laser with feedback. That's again at this current we recover back the low frequency fluctuation regime. So for the dynamics of one of the lasers at least, you see that is diminishing of the single laser with feedback. If you look at the time trace and also if you look at the at the autocorrelation, the autocorrelation you see again the low frequency fluctuations here for the envelope and then the peaks spaced by the delay time. Well in this case is the coupling the coupling time between the, the two lasers. Um, very interesting, let's see what happens if you look at the time trace of both lasers. So the two lasers are doing a similar thing but at a different time. And that's here an enlargement of the time traces of laser 1 and laser 2. One of the time traces I downshifted for clarity, so the, the, the vertical scale is not important, but the horizontal scale, it is important. So you see that this event, for instance, which is uh, clearly recognized in the time series, happens at a different time in, in the two lasers. So in this case, there has been a symmetry breaking, so the, the synchronization is zero, a zero lag exists but is unstable and if you compute a cross correlation of laser 1 and laser 2 you see that there is no, no peak at t equals 0 so that's the cross correlation between laser 1 and laser 2 and the peak is not here but it is shifted to plus minus the delay or the coupling delay and also notice that the peak here uh, plus the delay is larger slightly larger than the other peak at minus the delay that means that uh, very often the laser 1 is advancing laser 2. So you will have a leader, which would be laser 1, and uh, the other laser is following in this case. And since here we don't have the zero lag synchronization is lost, here it was proposed another setup which then stabilizes the, the zero lag synchronization. And in this case we have the two couple lasers. Uh, which are these two, and there is a semi-transparent mirror in, in between the two lasers. So if you relate it to the, to the model for laser 1, then you would have some coupling strength and coupling delay from laser 2, and some uh, self-feedback for laser 1. And then uh, for laser 2, it would be a similar thing, but with the indices exchange. So again, then first the time traces, as recorded, at this current, so dynamics very similar in the low frequency fluctuation regime, which is very easy to, to recognize visually. That's why it's also very convenient to work and to optimize the, the parameters. And uh, if you look at the titles, they look identical, and if you compute the cross correlation or you look at the at the understanding of the time trace, you see that they are doing the same thing at the same time. So in this case, the cross correlation between laser 1 and laser 2 is at C, uh, has the largest peak at zero, at t equals zero, and then plus minus the, the delay. It's important to note to know that the amplitude of the cross correlation peak is well above 95%, which for experimental in this, in this situation in the lab, in the experimental situation, then you can really say that the zero lag synchronization is stable with these values of the cross correlation. Yet another, let me describe yet another setup. And now you, you've seen the single laser with coin optical feedback, then two lasers coupled with, uh, without a, a semi transfer mirror and with a semi transfer mirror. In other cases, it was coherent uh, coupling or coherent feedback. Now, let me show you what happens when you have an element which rotates the polarization of the feedback. So it, in this case, it's called polarization, polarization related optical feedback. It can also be called incoherent feedback, sometimes in the literature. And this is the theta. So again, we have the laser. Then everything is coupled uh, with fibers. And here we have this fiber coupler. And 90% of the light of this coupler is sent to this element here. And that, that element here, which is very tiny, is a Faraday rotator mirror. So the light that goes up from the laser with one polarization thanks to this Faraday rotator mirror, will be returned to the laser with a 90 degrees rotation. So it will be orthogonal to the light emitted by the, by the laser. 
first thing that you, you see in the lab when you measure this type of feedback, uh, you measure the power versus injection current, and in this case, there's no uh, change in the threshold of the laser. So in, in red and black here, the, the power emitted by the laser, by the laser with and without uh, feedback, so that means that then since the laser, the feedback is not going in, then it doesn't reduce the threshold. Why does not interact with the targets and reduce the targets? It, as you will see, it changes the dynamics, but it doesn't change the threshold. So in, from that case, that was, was one of the differences. So because here we are looking at the average power. So in the average power, you don't see a difference. But of course, if you, have the, if you look at the time trace, then the dynamics uh, becomes, instead of being stable as it would be without the feedback, now it becomes uh, chaotic uh, due to this, uh, to the use, uh, extern well, this external feedback. So if you look here, uh, these are detected uh, time trees, uh, again, it shows a chaotic evolution. And in the frequency spectrum, it's, it goes, uh, so here, it goes again above 10 gigahertz, but you see more clear, for instance, it would be the realization oscillation frequency of the laser. So compared to the spectrum of the laser with feedback, which is much broader, in this case it's not so, not so broad, but it's still interesting for some application. And we want to use this as a generation of random numbers. So the, the 5 gigahertz is the frequency of the delay, of course. This yeah. no. This is the transition uh, oscillation of the frequency. So that's the natural uh, so what frequency. Is the, 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 the late time would be in the megahertz range. And you, you know, in this setup, the nice thing is that you almost lose the signature of the delay because if you look at the autocorrelation, for instance, this uh, is a, so. In, in this plot here, I show the the autocorrelation versus time for this uh, system at this current, and then in this case the, the delay is this peak and this other peak here. So the, the correlations at the delay time are much smaller than in the case of coherent feedback. And we are interested in that, we want to get, for this application, of we want to use it uh, for ran the generation of random bits, then it's not good to have structures into the signal generated by the laser, and normally when you have feedback, you have this repetition every delay time. So one of the possibilities to use this kind of setup, where if you look at the autocorrelation, you look for these peaks at the delay time, and you plot the maxima of these peaks versus current, and then you identify that at certain current, those peaks are at the, the lowest. And then the critical one is the one at two is the delay time. Yeah, in general, it's that's the case. Could be, it could be, yeah. The yeah. Yeah, yeah. Normally, uh, here also I give the reference, it could be that there is an interaction between the T and the T M modes of the laser, because normally the T mode is the one which has the most power, but then since you rotate 90 degrees of polarization, it could be that you have some interaction, and maybe that's why you have the, the peak, that's why it's the, the delay, not that one delay. So what's the structure of the laser, which kind of H emission? Yeah. It is they are emissions or, or no, it's an emission. So the, the, there is one polarization which happens very well to the to the target, and the other very bad. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, so I would expect uh, so that the the should be I expect that only a minor influence of the of the delay on the yeah. So actually, normally for all the other experiments, I give an, an equation or a model to relate to. In this case, we are not completely sure which one it is. But normally we, uh, we have to resolve the experiments with polarization, if it's possible. But then maybe we see if there is an interaction of the two modes. Or, uh, normally it would be very tiny. Could be that there is a small interaction. But because uh, what would be more important, the, the interaction between the light going again in, into the laser when it pulses, or the light pulses twice, then it becomes, it becomes polarizing in the right way? You know? Yeah, we have to perform so the yeah, we are not sure yet, but uh, I think it could be any of the two, but normally then if you resolve with polarization, then that uh, question will be solved. So far we didn't look at that. We look at the total power of the of the laser. Yeah. And 
interesting, interesting representation of this system is since again uh, for the run, for the generation of random bits that this is a, a slide uh, no solver is working on that and she gave me this, this slide. So this is a representation of the well it's a bit difficult to explain, let's see. We have the the amplitude of the time series of the laser in gray scale, the in this representation. And then in this we plot here <coughs> segments of the length of the delay and we plot these segments of the length of the delay, so we cut the signal in segments and we plot these segments on top of each other. And in such a way you get this representation and you can identify there the if there are structures every delay time, for instance. Or any pattern you would recognize. And for instance here you see that at this current, close to the threshold of the laser, you see that the, for a while the, there is a memory in the system, for instance. So this wouldn't be good for the for random bits. Because it's here that you can't believe what is here if you know what happened before. But if you look at the at the picture uh, of this spatial temporal representation at 19 milliamps, then you see that there is a random distribution of the amplitudes in the what you can call pixels in, in the in this in this graph. So this would be good for the generation of random amplitudes. So now I've discussed about the coin optical feedback, the cap, the two lasers coupled, then the polarization of the optical feedback. So it's only to so let me, I also want to show you what uh, we were doing with Loran when Loran Lager was here in the summer. That's the system where you have the laser with an, an, electro, an electronic feedback. And this is the, the setup now. We have here the laser. The laser is uh, sent, the light of the laser is sent to this modulator. This is a much tender modulator. And the trick here is that the signal that goes out from the modulator is sent back to this uh, fiber loop of 4 kilometers and it is transformed from optical to electrical and that electrical signal is the one that modulates the mass tender. So in such a way you have a feedback loop and this feedback loop will, will again induce instabilities in the dynamics of the system. In this case the modeling is slightly different, well it's different from the previous one because now it's an Ikea time modeling and we have the feedback strength or the relative strength and the feedback delay but in a cosine squared function. And all the electrical part here is shown in this picture. This uh, Laurent Larger made this prototype and it's in, in the lab to see. So just the interesting dynamics of this system is uh, it's an interesting modulator here which, so we see chaos in intensity of the laser. And this is the amplitude of the laser, the detected amplitude of the laser versus time, and you see that there are some chaotic oscillations. And also you see that there is a well this is the frequency, sorry, the frequency spectra, and you see that there is an envelope and the peaks here are spaced according to the inverse of the delay time in the external value. So that's typical of delay induced dynamics. And if you look at the autocorrelation, you see there is a central peak at t equals zero, and then every delay time there is a peak of correlation the corresponding to the, the, the delay dynamics. And uh, this system, for instance, one of the parameters that you can play with is the strength of the nonlinearity. So, what is the limit of the? It's well, I didn't know, but it's four kilometers of fiber. That in nanoseconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think it's something like 20 microseconds, I think. 20 microseconds. Since we use electronic feedback, then the time scales of this system are, instead of gigahertz, are in the megahertz range, in this case. So, in this, so the other thing, so this is in the, the megahertz range, while the, in the other case it was uh, gigahertz uh, for the laser. And that's because of the bandwidth of the electronic part. So we build this system and then the, the amplifiers and so on in the electronic part, which have at, uh, 10 megahertz bandwidth. Okay, so. so that's... Yeah. So I don't understand why the 
spectrum looks more like the rainbow frequency spectrum. In this case? Yeah. Well, it depends. <coughs> So what you see here is you have more or less. Normally, probably you are look, uh, used to see it in these lanes, I guess. And then from there you have a flat part, and then you have a decay part. Yeah, I get the question of, of more specific. This is the optical spectrum of the. Of the ah, this is the this is the electrical spectrum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So exactly, that's the spectrum in the electrical domain. So one of the parameters to play here is the strength of the reality. So, it was, so this, this parameter here. And when you create the strength of the nonlinearity, then you have, again, a chaotic evolution of the signal. And if you look at the spectrum, now the signature of the delay is less clear. So now you don't find these oscillations, which are seen here, here corresponding to the delay, and also in the autocorrelation, because of the stronger nonlinearity, then also here you only have one peak at the delay time and then you don't see uh, the other cause of the delay which are seen when the, the normality is smaller. And just to, to finish, a bit also not, I don't want to forget about the electronics lab and then in that case here I want to comment on the system that we did with, in this case we performed the magic glass equation and and this is a prototype of the system, and this is the typical shape of the nonlinearity for this system, input voltage versus output voltage. So this is the Mackey class nonlinearity, and in this case we studied what happens when you couple more than one <coughs> you know, more than one oscillator. So in this case we had ten of these Mackey class oscillators, so we coupled to each other and we coupled them with delay. So this is a delay line also that we have in the electronics lab that can be used for other applications, and one of them is uh, to study the use of and here these are the, the results. I gave a seminar about mathematical glass elements uh, a while ago, but then just to summarize those results, uh, for one element we delay, chaotic evolution of the, of the time, voltage versus time, then the frequency spectrum, again uh, decaying envelope, and the peaks spaced by the delay time. And that uh, can be seen in data correlation. Uh, the central peak corresponding to the chaotic dynamics and then the peaks and the delay time. And uh, inter the interesting uh, part of this study was that when you couple a lot of elements, the nonlinearity is stronger, so you reproduce more or less the same time trace, but if you look at the spectrum of one of the oscillators, you see almost no fingerprint of the delay in the ring, and in the same autocorrelation, you will see this tiny peak in the autocorrelation, and then that is to show that even though the delays needed to induce the dynamics, maybe you don't find the signatures in the in the in the, in the spectra or in the auto okay, so I would like to know what happens if you plot the neutral information for this piece. Yeah. So normally what happens is a is a similar thing. If you plot the neutral information in this case, then you will have a large value and then as when you increase the number of elements in the, in the ring, you have less and less neutral information. Between, for instance, if you measure the neutral information between uh, distant elements, then the neutral information is reduced. And yes, I also want to thank Ben for his collaboration in this, in this work because he's the director of his lab and he has also. Uh, implemented the TUA <coughs> the oscillators. It would be for demonstrations to students that can be used for this purpose, and they are well document documented by PEP, like here the, the example of the Rosle. And so, in case you have any suggestion, maybe you can ask PEP and he will be able to look at it. So, just as a more or less, yes, uh, we are I'm going to end the, the presentation with some. So giving an overview why we want to use this semi total lasers with, with the data. So some applications for it are the implementation of protocols for secure distribution of keys <coughs> in, a, in a public channel, for instance, if you use the geosynchronization in the case of distant elements, for instance, and then the generation of random bits, like is the case of the polarization rotated optical feedback. And also, I didn't talk about it, but then 
will have the seminar uh, by Ingo Fisher in the future, uh, talking about this information processing or reservoir computing, which is very important, will be a very important application of the experiments in the lab in the future. And also, from the fundamental point of view, we've seen that there is a rich phenomenology that uh, when you couple these uh, oscillators with delay, appear, this, uh, this phenomenology appears, and then it can stimulate also the theoretical studies. In, it was the case, for instance, for the delay coupled laser, first the experiments came, and it was uh, so interesting, and then some theoretical studies on that uh, evolved. And also interesting that the uh, systems with delay are high dimensional, in theory they are three dimensional, but uh, very interesting to study these high dimensional developments. And concerning the lab itself, it's important that you know that uh, we are the technological edge uh, for, for both uh, temporal and frequency detection. So maybe there is a chance to discover some new physics of these of this lasers, with this uh, equipment. And then maybe studying, uh, well, we will study also uh, lasers with different architectures or, or materials. And let me tell you that here with uh, Luciano and, and co workers, we also, uh, with experimental results, we also going to publish the first uh, paper with the experimental results here. And just that you see what happens in the lab. Here yeah, I show some pictures. And <laughs> thank you for all this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for attention. Thank you again. There were already a few questions. Uh, you have <coughs> one. Are there more questions or comments? Do you have plans to move beyond semi-contact processes? <laughs> no, not that I know. <laughs> but we will study different architectures. Of, so we now we will have HMEs, but of course we will also measure the pixels and maybe at some point semiconductor semi measures. That is to see in the picture. But we are open to the systems. But we're not restricted to mm -hmm. semiconductor measures. But uh, the, the lab equipment, let's say, focuses mostly on this rather wavelength recognition. Uh, so all the fast detection and fiber equipment is rather for all the telecommunication wavelengths, but that means that similarly to lasers, also amplifiers, of which we also already have some in the labs, uh, can be looked at uh, passive components and certainly also fiber laser components uh, are always an option uh, that one can look at to, to realize certain conditions. So it's not a restriction to that particular kind of laser. Um, but let's say in the photonics labs, some of the equipment is restricted to weight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if there's not uh, more questions, I think that uh, Miguel also offers to guide everybody around. Yeah, the yes, get your interested, you are welcome to uh, give the things a look at real life rather than on transparency. Yeah.